All right, so the idea um, is I'm going to pick up uh, again a little bit after where Le Neville left off and where I left off. Uh, and uh, we're going to look again at how some of these concepts of feedback control, feedback control, impedance control, uh, how they can be applied to understanding how humans are doing movement. And so some of the experiments that have been done recently, much more recently, uh, to address these questions. Uh, to, so to get us back into the things, if we're looking at this, I, I presented the equation originally, uh, the question originally in terms of feed-forward control. Uh, you invert what you think your, your plant is supposed to do, you invert that, and you generate that to, uh, use that to generate your motor command. Feedback control says, I don't need to know what the plant is going to, how it acts, I just measure where I am and compare it to where I want to be, and multiply by some game factor. And as I said, we can combine the two here, it's more explicit. This is exactly that. I can compute my best guess of what I think the motor, the, uh, motor system will do, invert that and generate a motor command that way. And then on top of that, I can add feedback. It says you measure what really happens, compare that to what I wanted to happen, and add some correction on top of that. So uh, what you should understand is it's not one or the other. We can do both. Uh, I want to pick up just a comment here. There's another formulation of this. This is the way I just uh, described it to you. But if we look at this, this is equivalent. Here, if you look at just this part, this is a feedback system. OK, so I have what I want to happen goes in here. And I compare just as I said before. But on top of that, you can add in an inverse model here that will allow you to do feed-forward control. And this is, I think, what Neville was referring to as a virtual position, a virtual state, where it's not necessarily attainable. So now, this is no longer what I want here, this virtual equilibrium position. If you look no further, I don't know how to do that. If you don't look any further than here, this virtual equilibrium position is like your set point. It's like your desired trajectory. But it's not a trajectory I necessarily want to do. It's a trajectory that I've computed that will give me this desired trajectory knowing something about uh, what the system will do. And yet I'll still be attracted to this virtual equilibrium point uh, with these dynamical properties that will tend to stabilize my system. And so there are ways to, uh, and these are mathematically equivalent at some level, and so you can imagine doing uh, feed-forward control even though uh, you have this intrinsic feedback system in your peripheral system. So now we're going to ask the question is, well, what can we use impedance for? Uh, is it, uh, it, okay, we can use it to move from one point to the other, but what I attempted to show you before is that you can modulate impedance as well. So uh, we looked at the properties of um, engineering systems and said, okay, if I adjust the stiffness, I can do this. If I adjust the damping, I get this. Humans can do the same thing. They have the ability to modulate their impedance. How can I do that? Well, if I'm here, sitting here and all relaxed, I have a fairly low impedance. But the muscles have the property, if you activate them, they get stiffer. So if I'm sitting here and I co-contract my agonist and antagonist muscles, now my, my arm becomes more rigid. It's more stiff. So by co-contracting, I have the possibility of modulating the impedance. I also have the possibility of modulating impedance by changing the gains of the reflex loops. So if your stretch reflex says, if you stretch me this much, I'm going to activate my muscle by 10, that'll give me one stiffness. If I say now, if I stretch you the same amount, I'm going to activate my muscle by 20, now I have a stiffer system. Okay. So the human uh, neuromuscular system has the possibility of modulating impedance. It also has the possibility of shifting the equilibrium position and, and, and doing feed forward control. And so now the question I want to, use that, to, to ask here is, can we use that to do disturbance rejection? Okay, and so for this example, I'm going to define a disturbance reduction in this way. Imagine now that I'm doing this trajectory. Trajectory font. <coughs> Excuse me. I would like the hand to follow this trajectory from this position to this position, a joint or what have you. We're going to ask the question, well, what happens if there's this external force that happens? during the movement. Things happen. And so what that external force is going to do is push me off the desired trajectory. How can I respond to that? Suggestions? Now I have to remember which order my slides are in. One way to do that is by increasing the stiffness of my system, increasing the impedance of my system. So here, first of all, if I take the unperturbed movement, if you remember one of the slides I showed earlier, by increasing the stiffness, we increase the speed of, of the, the response. 
So if here, if I have a purely feedback system of trying to follow this equilibrium position, and I get this response with this delay, if I increase the stiffness, it's going to follow it more closely. I don't need as much of an error to generate the same force, and so this system will respond more quickly, but it's going to essentially do an even better job of following this trajectory. But it's also going to have the effect of reducing the effects of this perturbation. So if I'm stiffer and the same force hits me, okay, because I'm stiffer, I'm going to move off, less off that desired trajectory and, and move back to the, the, uh, the desired trajectory more quickly. Okay. Is there another way? Well, <clears throat> I can also, if I can anticipate the perturbation, okay, if I can anticipate the perturbation here, uh, I can correct for it by telling my system not to do what I really want to do, but do what I need to do in order to get this trajectory. So here on the red trial, if I set the virtual equilibrium trajectory, I'll give it a little extra bump because I know this is going to happen. And by doing so, I can imagine that I bring the system back uh, to uh, the desired trajectory. So now I'm going to ask the question, which mechanism uh, is being used in a couple of example experiments? These experiments are done with humans. This one is a, a key experiment. It surprised me at the time that it came out. And uh, it was really convincing for me, uh, but I shouldn't have jumped again uh, to say what it convinced me of. But here's the experiment. You build a room, it has no windows in it, but you put it on top of a big motor and the, and the room can spin around. So you make the room turn at 60 degrees per second. Okay, and an interesting thing about the human vestibular system is, if you know, the inner ear is sensitive to rotations of the head. So you'd say, okay, you know you're spinning, but no, because it dies out, that signal dies out. So after a few seconds, or I forget how long it takes, a couple minutes anyway, you no longer have a signal in your ear telling you that you're spinning. And you're sitting in a room that's spinning, so everything's moving with you, so you have no visual information telling you it's spinning. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, if you move your head, you'll probably throw up, and that'll tell you that you're spinning. But if you don't do that, uh, you're pretty much in a stable reference frame as far as your sensory information is going. But you have this effect called Coriolis force. Now, who remembers what a Coriolis force is? Yes. So, um, because of the microphones, I won't ask you to do it. But uh, Coriolis force is an interesting effect. If you're spinning around like this and I make a linear movement, the effect of the Coriolis force is to push you outwards. Okay? And the characteristics of the Coriolis force is proportional to the angular velocity, how you're spinning, the linear velocity of your hand here, okay? and uh, times some factor, and it's the cross product. So it's perpendicular to the way your hand is moving. And I vaguely remember a very good demonstration of that in the course I took from you. Uh, and so we should have gotten you to do this part of this. So you're spinning around, and if you, if you want to test this, go to Disneyland. And you know the teacups? You get on the Mad Hatter teacups, you just start spinning around, and all you have to do is do this. Okay, and what happens is, is when you move your hand, you get a force that's perpendicular to the line of movement. Right? And that force is proportional to the speed that you're spinning, but also the speed of the hand, which means that when the hand comes to rest again, there's no longer any force. Okay, so it's a very interesting kind of force because it's only happening when you're moving, not when you're stationary. Okay? And so uh, the head subject sitting in the center of this room, so you don't, also you don't feel the centrifugal forces. You're sitting in the center, but if you're sitting there, and what they do is they have subjects do this point-to-point -point movement while they're sitting without the room turning. Then they start spinning the room and they wait a couple minutes. And then they have subjects move their hand again from point to point movements. Okay? And then they stop the room. And then they wait a few minutes and they have them do it again. And you should know that they, they show the subject the target, but then when they move, there's no visual feedback about their hand. Okay? So they're moving these to remember position. And so uh, <coughs> you get this Coriolis force during this movement. And here's the results of that experiment. There's a black line here, it's hard to see, it's underneath the points here, but that's the nominal movement. That's what people do uh, when they're sitting in the regular room that doesn't move. You tend to move in a straight line from the starting position to the ending position, that's in most cases, okay? Then what happened is they, they did that for 40 trials and people are doing more or less straight line movements. Then they started the room spinning. They waited a few minutes so that all these other uh, corollary effects go by. And then they did the first trials. And these white dots here are what the subject did at the very beginning. So the very first trial they did, they went up like that. Okay. But then they let subjects, the room's still spinning, uh, and they let the subjects keep going, and they gradually get better. So that 
after a certain amount of time, I think it's about 40 trials here, here these gray dots are what happens, the room is still spinning, but the subject has, has had a chance to practice in the room. So now they're going back to moving more or less to a straight line. Then they stop the room, okay, wait a couple minutes, and then they have to do the, the, the movement again. And now what happens is there's no Coriolis force, but subjects do up this, okay? That's the data. My question to you is, is this evidence for feedforward control, or is it evidence for feedback control? Okay, I'm going to get somebody to say feedback. Does anybody say feedback? No? Yeah, okay, but let's start with feedback. Who, you at least agree there's some feedback? Somebody back there, I didn't see. Why? Okay, corrected over time. So that's a kind of feedback from one trial to the next. So they had to be correcting based on something and they couldn't see, okay? But I would argue the, there's even evidence for some uh, feedback during the trial. Anyone want to buy that one? Right, so this little hook here, they started coming back to the right position. They didn't get to the final position, but they started coming back. And if you remember, the Coriolis force is only that way. So there was nothing in the Coriolis force that would bring you back. So some force generated by the arm started to bring the hand back. It just didn't get all the way there. So if, if you agree with me, there's some evidence for feedback control uh, on this thing. So the answer is yes, there is and it's both. So there's some evidence for feedback control, including the correction of the hand towards the target. Now, is there evidence for feed forward? And the answer is yes, we already got that. So why? What, if, what, if, what are the arguments to say it's feed forward? One is you don't get all the way back, right? So if, if it was purely feedback control and I've stopped the hand, the Coriolis has disappeared. So there's no reason why the springs shouldn't bring my hand all the way to the final position, but it didn't. Now we could argue about maybe there was some friction somewhere that we didn't take into account, but still, there's some evidence that they didn't generate, you know, they got this force going this way and they didn't generate enough force to come back. There's this learning effect, and then there's this after effect. The after effect is this is what happened when the subject, the, the room stopped moving. This is the first trial they said, oop, and they did that. And for me, that was the strongest evidence that uh, th these subjects are adjusting the virtual trajectory. And then you can see that here is, as what we said earlier, what they did was they computed a feed-forward correction. They anticipated the perturbation. And they computed a change in the desired trajectory, which is, wasn't what they really wanted to do. But because there's the perturbation, the hand ends up doing what you wanted it to do. And then you take away the perturbation. We stop the room from moving. And what happens is now you get this effect in the other direction, right? The subject has compensated by planning a trajectory that goes a little bit to the left, and because uh, there is no protruding force, it ends up uh, actually going to the left. So this is an experiment that uh, convinced me that it's not just equilibrium point control, okay? I don't think anybody ever really said it was, uh, to be honest, uh, but if you take it from a, a sort of a servo point of view, it's quite convincing that subjects aren't just, uh, aren't just blindly planning a trajectory and hoping that the system will get there. They are planning the trajectory and a virtual trajectory that can help them to overcome certain perturbations. I forget the details. I can find you the paper, but I think it's a couple of minutes. Do you remember? I was one of the subjects in the details. Ah. That's right. But this is, but, but this they, is you're saying that you're changing the, the, the rotational velocity slowly, so you might not get that after effect. But I believe they would have waited. These guys are experts in vestibular. They study vestibular system. I don't know what got them to study our movements, uh, but it's a good thing they did. But uh, uh, they would have known just to wait until those transients died out. So, but I don't know that. But we can find the details in the paper. In fact, I, the, the paper's on the reading list, I think. It's maybe the one I don't have legally, though, so maybe it's not available.
Yeah, but there's a whole set of experiments that were done where they, they use these curl fields, and it's, it really gives the same idea. But for me, it's an interesting difference, and I, I didn't plan to talk about them. But in one case, the Coriolis force is interesting because it, there's no contact. It's like gravity. I mean, it's acting on the whole limb ver versus when you're holding this handle and doing these uh, curl fields, you have this contact. In I think talking about both of those would be fascinating and, and, and trying and to compare what's happening in one case versus the other. Are you able to learn the same way if you have the contact force versus you don't? I think it's, a, it's an interesting perturbation. So it just happens I heard this story before I heard the other one. But, uh, but still, they're both very interesting. Well, define good. Yeah, but look how long it took them. Okay, so I want to say, I mean, I don't mean, what's good? I mean, they got it in the right direction. I didn't see them going off in the other direction. But on the other hand, maybe it's a gradual thing, and, and, and so I don't, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, there's probably people here who know a lot more about the learning aspects of that. What's going on here? Uh, and and what, what, you know, what does that mean in terms of uh, how good the system is? Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit amazing for me why the subjects don't overshoot over the, like, uh, you know, like uh, over the normal zero behavior. Like they don't do something a little bit like a strange to explore and then come back, you know, after that. Yeah, and uh, I, I, was, I didn't do the experiments. I didn't, wasn't even subject. I couldn't tell you all the details of what, what goes on here, whether there might have been some overshooting behavior. I don't really know, but that would be a good question to ask them. Uh, how is it that they're finding precisely? It looks to me here that they're gradually getting to the right answer and they won't go any further. Um, but I, could, I think if I understand your question, maybe in another case they might overcompensate one trial and come back, and we don't, I don't know anything about that, but uh, it sounds reasonable to me that that could happen in other situations. Okay, so that's one experiment that I found to be very interesting. <coughs> Here's the second one, and Etienne is here somewhere? Still? Yeah. I did find my email, so I did have your permission. So uh, uh, I'm talking about an experiment. Already I talked about experiments that Neville did with the media, et cetera, in the past. And now I'm going to talk about experiments that somebody else did, who's here in the room that also did, but he'll tell you about it later. But here's a different experiment. Here, now we're talking about these handles. So you have a, a robot, a two-dimensional robot in the plane, and you have a human subject grab onto the end of it. And you can perturb the hand by uh, programming the robot to do interesting things. And here what they programmed the robot to do was to do this divergent force field, meaning the subject was doing something similar to what we just said. They're moving, make a move from here to here. Okay, but now it's the robot that's going to provide this disturbing force. And what they did was they provided a force here that is proportional to the distance away from the line. So if you're right on the line, no force. If I go a centimeter to the right of the line, I get a force to the right. And if I go two centimeters to the right, I get an even greater force. Okay, so this force to the right is going to push me farther and farther away. It's not going to help me get back. It's actually going to push me away. It's an unstable force. On the other hand, if you go to the left, if you go a centimeter to the left, you get a little bit of force on, still to the left. You go even farther to the left, and you get even more force to the left. So this is an unstable divergent force field. And so what they did was they had subjects move first with the robot turned off. They're just moving the robot in and out. Okay? And these are the kind of trajectories that they get. Okay? And then what happens is they turned on this divergent force field, and what they see happening is... Uh, some of the trials go to the right, some of the trials go to the left. And then you can see, after a certain amount of practice with the robot doing this divergent force field, this is what happens. You get some nice straight trajectories. And then they turn the robot off again, and there's no divergent force field, and this is what happens. And so I'm going to ask you, did I put the green square? What's going on here? If I had make you choose between these two possibilities, what would you say the, the subject's doing? I'm going to give you the data back again so you can think about it. Higher Sorry? Higher, higher stiffness. Yes, but I usually don't let people like you answer. Did somebody else over there say higher stiffness? Okay, so here's the idea is that if you, if you take the same analogy before, uh, <clears throat> if you increase impedance, 
you decrease the effect of the perturbation. And there's some evidence for that here. When you, if you imagine that they're increasing impedance, now they will compensate for this perturbation. Okay, so they'll do a better job of staying on the straight line. But removing it doesn't generate a compensating movement. Whereas if you do a feed forward one, you're trying to guess which way the perturbation is going to be. If you know which way it's going to be, you expect to see this after effect. And again here, when they turned the robot off, there was no evidence of after effect. So the idea here is that uh, the subjects were, in response to this divergent force field, increasing the stiffness of their arm in order to uh, reject the disturbances from the external device. Okay, and um, what was I going to say? Uh, <clears throat> why did they do that? Why did they not do what, what the, the subjects did with the Coriolis force? It's unpredictable, exactly. So the Coriolis force, if I'm moving this way, it's always that way. Here, the force field is such that if I'm moving right on line, there is no perturbation, first of all. And second, the direction of the perturbation will depend on whether I make a smaller to the right or a smaller to the left. And unless the subject could know that, they, they, they wouldn't know in advance whether they need to generate an extra force to the right or to the left. I, asked the, I don't know. <laughs> Etienne? <laughs> what was the time period? <laughs> I don't know. What's the question? This is over the, the period of minutes, right? Or, or, or not? Yeah. Uh, what's the time scale of the practice? And so, yeah. I mean, it's short. I mean, I think you're saying it's not over days. It's over minutes. It's over. It's over a reasonable number, a small number of trials. And these guys can tell you more about that stuff later. Okay. But it's short. It's not huge. Okay. Yeah. Does that answer your question to the, that level of detail? And then you guys can talk more about that later. Yes and no. I mean... Here... But in any way, the, the proof as well is they also measured the stiffness. I'll let them talk about how they did that. But uh, you know, what I was trying to say is the point is if you can anticipate, you might expect them to increase their stiffness. What we see is we see no after effects and we see uh, even to some extent, you might argue, although I don't know if you can justify this statistically, is that there's even less variation from trial to trial here than here, uh, meaning that would be consistent with a higher stiffness as well. And they went on to measure the stiffness uh, and they could show that stiffness increases and it even increases uh, uh, selectively along the dimension that's important. Yeah, quick thing. So I think uh, one of the things I was wondering was whether, whether we shouldn't talk about uh, learning the scenarios as um, the question of whether these things are learnable or not, uh, or how easy is a particular force field or a disturbance uh, learnable or not. I agree with you, but I think that's a better discussion with that team because he's, his title is Learning Impedance, and I didn't want to talk about that. All I wanted to do was get to this point where he's saying is, to summarize, we can see how combined feed-forward and feedback control forces can be useful con for controlling trajectories. Okay? Uh, feed-forward correction is useful when you can predict it. So the Coriolis force, I could predict it, therefore I could generate a new motor command that would compensate for it. When it's not predictable, then feedback Impedance correction is important. And so, this is the conclusion I want to get to before handing back over to Neville, I think, is the next slide, is the brain can use both of these mechanisms uh, can, by specifying equilibrium points, virtual equilibrium points, and impedance, as well as, or maybe even instead of forces, as a robust uh, method of control.
Any questions while we're trading computers? So you're saying that it is unpredictable, the perturbation, but uh, it is somehow something like a quadratic term which you know just forces you to right or left. Do you have any idea if we replace that by just random left or right vectors in each side? It will, you know the subjects will behave yeah. the same? What I know about that is, uh, I remember some experiments that even predate this by Musa Valdi and, and Neville, I'm sure, was involved, uh, where they actually did that. They looked at the posture, of, they looked at two-dimensional stiffness of subjects holding a posture. And then, first of all, they measured their stiffness by making displacements. Okay, I can talk about that more in detail, but essentially they're trying to, to measure how much, what is the impedance of the limb by, measuring, by imposing static displacements and measuring the restoring force. And then they said, can you get humans to change that, modulate that? And with what I remember the results are is they, so they, what they did was they shook, uh, they, they did an oscillation movement of the robot handle in one direction with the idea then, could you see that subjects would get stiffer in that direction? And the answer was no, which is interesting because that's what made these guys' paper so interesting is because at that point they weren't able, nobody had been able to show that you could change the shape of the stiffness field. That if you're two times stiffer this way than this way, and you had this perturbation, you still are two times stiffer this way than this way. What you did see was that the, the stiffness goes up in all directions, but it went up equally in all directions. Okay. So, so to get back to your question is if you just vibrate them, maybe it's not the same thing as having an unstable stiffness field, a divergent field, like you said, a quadratic, or something that gets stronger the farther away you get. That has a, a, a certain property of stability. That environment is intrinsically unstable. So therefore, you could see these modulations of stiffness to make this, the coupled system stable again. Whereas, if you just oscillate them, well, if I let, just let the handle do this randomly, I won't go very far. Okay, I may end up moving, but I won't go very far. And there, there was little evidence that the subjects were finely tuning their impedance. There was someone right behind you, and then, yeah. So, um, if I understand you correctly, uh, correctly you, you say that it's not fee forward control if you increase your stiffness, because you don't see any uh, after effects or anything. But you don't see after effects in the trajectory itself, but you would see after effects in EMG activity. So why, could, couldn't you just say, uh, I know exactly what the perturbation is. If I don't keep it on a straight line, it's going to knock my arm off the off the rail. So I'll just increase my stiffness, uh, work that into my motor program or whatever you want mm -hmm. to call it, and uh, and then feed forward, ballistically control my arm without any. Yes. So let me ask you. It's a semantic question, sort of. Yes. It yeah, is. <laughs> when we say feed forward, feed back, then you have to say. Feed forward feedback control of what? And so up to this point, I've been saying feed forward feedback control of, and I said explicitly one or two times, and maybe implicitly, a force. Now you're saying is what you could do is you could feed forward control the co-contraction and not modulate that again, but the forces won't be constant. They'll be dependent on the interaction with the environment. But as far as your motor command is concerned, sending the, the activity to the muscles for their co-contraction levels, that would be feed forward control of the muscles activations, okay. but it would still imply some feedback-like behavior, even though it's passive, feedback back behavior of the force. So you have to be careful when you say feed forward feedback, feed forward feedback with respect to what? Okay. Okay. Thanks.